I figured the best way to think of a new idea is not to sit in my room and look at the wall now that I have sold my companies, but to get out there, talk to people, see what the rest of the world is doing. You gotta pick yourself up, go backwards, and slam yourself at the wall like 500 more times until the wall crumbles. 25% of middle school girls already believe they'll never achieve their dream career. Dream career. Dream career. Hi, I'm Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint. Hint. And you're Hint. listening to Unstoppable, a podcast spotlighting the journeys of inspiring entrepreneurs. I believe that at its core, leadership is about constantly learning from the people around you. And I'm so inspired by the conversations we're having in our upcoming episodes and can't wait to share them with you. This season, some of my guests include Rebecca Minkoff, fashion designer and founder of the Female Founder Collective, Diana Kaff, author of Girls Who Run the World, Andrew Dudham, founder of Hymns, and Eugene Rem, co-founder of Rumble Fitness, and much, much more. Plus, we ask the million dollar question, what does it really take to be unstoppable? Unstoppable. Let's find out. Hi, everybody. It's Kara Golden from Unstoppable, and we're so excited with our next guest here today, Joey Gracia. So excited you're here. How are you? I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me. I am really excited to be here and really excited to see you again. It's been yeah, so you too. We are old pals from way back when, and I'm really, really excited to have him here to talk about his new venture. And so for those of you who do not know Joey, he is the co-founder of Chef. And so check it out. It's mychef, M-Y-S-H-E-F.com. And a little bit about his background. So he's a former... Facebook employee and Forbes 30 under 30 entrepreneur. Since leaving Facebook, he has successfully built and sold two consumer food companies and has consulted for hundreds of startups. He's lived in the Bay Area. He's lived in Austin. He's lived in New York and back in the Bay Area now. Very, very excited to have him back here. And VCs and publicly traded companies he's worked with as well. And most recently, as I mentioned, founded Chef. Also did a company in between in the food space. So we got to know each other a little bit called Kutoa, which was awesome. And basically, Chef is a marketplace for empowering talented cooks to really make a meaningful income by selling homemade food in their communities, which is such a great idea, especially during this time when we are recording this during COVID and coming out of COVID, hopefully, fingers crossed. But the company recently raised $8.8 million in seed, not too bad. And their aim is to really help not only chefs, but also immigrants, refugees, and restaurant workers impacted by COVID. And it's such a great idea. So I'm super excited for you and super excited for everyone to hear a little bit more about this. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And so first, tell us a little bit about like, how did this all come about? Chef. Yeah, chef. Well, I feel like I, I kind of had to start from the beginning. It's been, it's been a long journey and you've known me for most of this journey. So you may know some of this story, but my journey in consumer food started way back when I was in, when I went off to college. And I grew up in an immigrant household. I was first generation. We had homemade meals every day, which in retrospect, I think I took for granted, which was incredible. And when I went off to college, I realized I had no clue how to cook a homemade meal. And so I started eating packaged food, fast food, and really whatever was most convenient and affordable for me as a college kid. And I also, at the same time, got really into working out. I had played sports through high school, but when I went to college, I no longer had sports. So I I got really into working out, was at the gym every day, lifting weights. And after about a year, this all caught up to me, right? I think many food entrepreneurs have the same kind of story where we are now trying to better the system and we all had a very traumatic and sometimes scary event impact us. And fortunately, we were able to turn these scary and sometimes very devastating events into opportunities to better ourselves and to better the system. And so for me, that came to a head in my sophomore year in college. And for about a six-month span, whenever I would go to the gym and my heart rate would go up, 
I would have these chest pains and pounding migraines to the point where my vision was blurred. I couldn't walk and I would have to lay down at the gym for several hours until I could move again. And I ended up in the hospital about three or four different times. And they did all these different tests. They thought it was internal bleeding for the longest time. They did a spinal tap, which is still one of the most traumatic events. When I think back, I, I hate needles and a spinal tap is having a giant needle shoved up your back. Yeah, I've had one of those. It's not very fun. (laughs) Not very fun. Not something you want to do. And after about six months, they could not find the issue. They could not find the problem and why this was happening. And I finally just met with a dietitian and a nutritionist who asked me, you know, what is your daily routine? What is your diet like? And I explained, you know, how I went to the gym and I was eating these different foods. And at the time, I was eating a lot of packaged meats. I thought these were really healthy because there was no fat and no carbs and it was just pure protein. So From what I was hearing, that was healthy for you, right? It didn't matter what it was. It was pure protein. And so it ended up that the nitrates and sodium were causing high blood pressure. I was diagnosed with high blood pressure when I was 19 years old. And I was told by the nutritionist, you need to stop eating packaged food and fast food. You need to have homemade food. You need to cook for yourself. And being a college student, I had no desire to learn how to cook. And so I started making nutrition bars for myself out of Uh, nut butters and dried fruits and seeds and nuts. And I would I would sell these kind of on the side to my clients. I actually became a personal trainer when I was like really into this whole phase in college. And I had the idea of selling these kind of as a business, as a food business, as we eventually got to, and to donate another bar to someone in need for every bar sold. Because like me, many people can't afford to shop at Whole Foods. So it's kind of be like a one for one Tom Shoes type concept. And like many of us, I took a great idea that I was probably scared to start and I put it on the back burner. And it wasn't until, you know, I went to go work at Facebook after college. You know, I thought that was the thing I should do. I should join a big company, a reputable company and get my career started. And not long after I started at Facebook, my, my mom passed away pretty suddenly from a health complication. And for me, That was a big turning point when I realized like our health is something that we take for granted so many of us until it's in danger or too late. And, you know, as much as I loved my experience at Facebook and I met so many incredible people, I really want to dedicate myself to what what we call empowering change by spreading health. That was a mission of Katoa, the first company I started. And so I started this company. I launched it a year from the passing of my mom and her memory in September 2011. And I didn't know anything about food. I think the only mentor I had in the food industry was you, Kara, who helped me so much along the way. Like we got into Whole Foods within three or four months. I had no idea what that meant. You know, we started dealing with distributors and UNFI and Kehi. And and for about six years, I ran this company. It was a very traditional CPG brand. We were dealing with retailers. And again, most of my days were dealing with brokers and distributors and retail buyers. That's the business of consumer food and packaged food. And in 2017, I kind of looked at what I was doing and I looked at my days and I realized I wasn't making the impact that I set out to make. I started this company because I had gotten sick and my mom had gotten sick and it was due to the lack of access to wholesome, nutritious meals. And I was dealing with retail buyers at Whole Foods and Costco all day. This was not making the impact I set out to make. Mm. And so... I really sold that first company, Katoa and Steam, those two brands that I sold in 2017, not because it was financially the best thing for myself, but really because I didn't think I was making the impact that I really thought I was going to make with those companies. And the idea for Chef came afterwards. And I I spent about a year after I sold those companies traveling the world. I figured the best way to think of a new idea is not to sit in my room and look at the wall now that I have sold my companies. But to get out there, talk to people, see what the rest of the world is doing. I love it. Yeah, how are their food systems operating? So I went to all the countries in the world that I thought had better food systems than America. I spent a lot of time in Israel because they have a self-reliant food system in the middle, the middle of the desert, which is actually quite remarkable. Portugal, Japan, South Africa. And I learned a lot about hydroponic farming and robotics and agriculture and all these amazing things happening. But the biggest thing I saw was that the communities that had a really high bar and really maintained a really great diet, wholesome food, nutritious food, had less disease than we have here in America. They had a system that was still, 
they still had a connection with their food, where it was produced, how it was produced, who made their food, who cooked their food. And that's something that unfortunately in America we've lost over the last 100 to 150 years, especially since the Industrial Revolution and the invention of preservatives and packaged food in the 50s. And so I thought, wouldn't this be cool if we can have a community-based food system where we cook for one another in the United States again? And this is not a new concept, right? People cooked in their communities and for families for thousands of years. It's a very, it's a very novel thing that we no longer do that. And I realized very quickly that 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 was illegal in America. You cannot do that. You cannot cook food and serve it to your community. It's actually illegal. And many companies had tried to do this, but unfortunately, regulators had cracked down on them and shut them down. And so I kind of put that, you know, I put, I was unfortunate. I put it to the side and said, okay, well, too bad. Let me keep thinking. And fast forward, when I was in Israel, I had the great fortune of meeting my now co-founder, Alvin. Alvin is a regulatory attorney. Uh, He was working in the White House at the time. And a few months later, after we met, I went to go visit him in D.C. And I went into his apartment to crash on his couch. And on his whiteboard, when I walked in, he had this idea for Chef. And I was like, Alvin, I have thought of this idea. I looked at it. It's illegal. You should know this. You're, You're an attorney. You can't do this. And he was the first one who told me that this was going to become legal in the state of California, which it did last January. So that was that was kind of where it all started. We decided that weekend we want to do it together. We actually filmed our video for Y Combinator that weekend. We submitted it. Faith has it that we got into Y Combinator the day after it became legal in California last January. And uh, the rest is kind of history. So you, you took this to Y Combinator. You didn't go through Y Combinator when you did Katoa. Yeah, no. And it's funny because I kind of went from, as you know, I went from Facebook and I'm from the Bay Area, right? Where I was born in this ecosystem where when things are broken, you fix them, you move fast, you continue to iterate, learn. And then I went into the food system, which you're very familiar with. And like, there's just things broken everywhere, right? The way we distribute food, the way we, the lack of accountability and the transparency. And that's what frustrated me, right? And when I, left Katoa and Steam and I sold those companies, I really did not want to get back into in the packaged food industry because I, I saw that if there was going to be change, like it really had to be disrupted. Yeah. And so we really intentionally created a tech company because we figured tech is the, the most direct and impactful way to make change. And Y Combinator is obviously like one of the best ways that you can expedite your learning as an entrepreneur. And we have great mentors there, the Airbnb folks and a lot of great partners there. So I definitely, I don't even think I really knew what Y Combinator was when I started Katoa, but, uh, but yeah, for, for chef, it's been amazing. There's a lot of great people that have come out of there and Jeff Ralston, who is one of the partners there. Jeff was actually my first investor. Oh, really? He always says very proudly, he, he couldn't understand why we were starting a beverage company. He's my next door neighbor up in Tahoe. And he slapped down the first $50,000 when he heard that we were starting this company. He's like, I have no idea what you're doing exactly, but I know you'll figure it out. And he walked out of the room and I, I was like, you should really understand what we're doing. You shouldn't invest in this unless you really understand it. And so Jeff still laughs today. You know, he was like, it's just like wild like he was like you know and he's a, such a huge believer that you know there's the idea but are, there's also the founders you know he's like you can just tell like yeah. these founders that are really you know the ones that make it so simple you know to understand but then also you know have a great idea but are also good people so he's somebody that i really first heard articulate that and i think it's so true i think kindness matters being curious, you know, things that, that I think he really looks for when he's, you know, looking for companies to kind of back in Y Combinator to grow. I mean, I think that that's another piece of it. So yeah, that was great to hear that you were part of that program because I think it's an awesome thing to be a part of. So you're leading a company in the midst of a pandemic, not only leading, but you're like growing. And what do you think are kind of the big you know, takeaways. You actually, I saw on social, maybe you were, were you in New York during the beginning of COVID when all of this went down? Yeah. I mean, tell me about it. Like, was it nutty? Yeah. I mean, COVID, you know, is such a, 
it's a crazy time and it's devastating for, for so many reasons. And even internally inside the company, we've had teammates lose family members and it's, it's definitely not something to be taken lightly. And so when COVID first started and no one really knew what to do and what was happening, I think the general advice from advisors and investors was to kind of wait it out, right? To, to pull back, to extend runway, reduce burn rate, and just kind of wait this whole time out. And we did that for about seven days. And then we said like, no, this is, you know, our applicants. So like, you know, to give you some sense, like a lot of our early adoption on our platform, we really were focusing on immigrants and refugees who are incredible cooks, right? But because they lack either technical skills or language barriers, like they really have a difficult time finding a job in the Bay Area or New York or these large cities, right? And we wanted to provide economic opportunity for them to make a meaningful income while staying at home with their children, which is huge, right? And it's a big part of our founding story. Alvin's family, they his parents were refugees from Iran. They struggled to survive when they came here. My dad's an entrepreneur as well. He was born and raised in Italy and came here. I saw him go through a bankruptcy as I was growing up and how difficult it was for him to be an entrepreneur. And so we really started the company for people like that. And there's so many amazing cooks like our families, right? And when COVID hit, you know, our applicants on the supply side to cook on the platform went from four per day to 40 per day to 80 per day. And I think right now we get over 100 applicants to cook on our platform every single day. We have a wait list of almost 6,000 people to cook in the Bay Area. Wow. And, and so we said, no, we can't, we can't just lean back and, and just take it easy. Like this is a time we need to step up and serve the community. This is the reason we started this company, right? And so we actually leaned in. And we raised some additional capital from our inside investors, just got something done so that we could push harder. We hired, we've doubled our team during COVID. And and yes, like you said, I actually flew out to New York. I found an Airbnb with two other teammates and we launched New York, which is the first expansion market ever, right? We've only operated in the Bay Area until now. And when COVID hit, we said, where can we make the biggest impact and help the most number of people right now? And the answer was clearly New York. Right. So it was crazy. But yes, we all got on the plane. We got a three bedroom Airbnb in Brooklyn and we were able to launch in New York within 15 days. We've now been live in New York for about two months. And there's so many incredible chefs cooking on the platform out in New York. But but yeah, it's been a wild time for us. We've grown a lot. And for us, what we're really focusing on is just helping as many people earn a meaningful income right now. And that's not just, you know, previously the people cooking on our platform, 95% of them had never cooked for money, right? So they had no idea how to create a menu and how much to charge and how to buy ingredients. And so we really created a core competency on coaching them on how to get photographs of their food and how to create a menu. But now a lot of people coming on the platform are not, you know, just amateur retirees and mothers. They are, they are professional cooks, blind cooks, caterers, people who had restaurants who unfortunately, because of COVID, can no longer operate or have lost their job or have been furloughed. And so our platform has become the sole source of income for a lot of them. Even now, we have a, we have a Michelin chef that, in New York City who was furloughed from his restaurant. And his so, sole source of income is cooking pastries on our platform in New York. So this is not just you know low-income people who are on the line. These are just we have Michelin chefs who are at the top of their game, right? right? That have now, unfortunately, because of COVID, fell on hard times. Well, I feel like even I talked to a friend of mine who was telling me her husband was at you know a restaurant in the Mission. He used to have a four month wait list, and finally, San Francisco opened up outdoor, you know, dining. But in the Mission, unfortunately, where they're located, you can't really dine outdoors. Like it's just not conducive for it. So they had to shut down the restaurant. And so, you know, and nobody's really hiring. Right. And so I could imagine that there, you probably would have a lot of incredible chefs at some of these places. And, you know, I was with some friends last night and we were talking about it, like the weather's finally, the smoke is cleared in the Bay area a bit. But, you know, come this winter or the rainy season, I mean, I wish we'd have more rain. Like, you know, what are these people going to do, 
right? Like, you know, as we head into winter and, you know, you look at places like New York too. So I think this is an amazing opportunity for, you know, income for lots of great people, but also just overall, I think it's, it solves a problem. So it's, it's an excellent, excellent idea and time. And like you said, it's not just for people who have never been chefs before. So go back to kind of how, how are you actually picking people to be on this platform or how are you getting the talent um, to come onto the platform? Yeah, it's, it's funny. We haven't actually done any outreach just because we have so many inbound chefs that are, that are applying and it is like a pretty rigorous process to get started on the platform because we do need to, you know, make sure you have your, you're properly permitted, you have your license Every county and every state is different. So we help you with that process. We make it very simple. You can get on board in around two weeks, but you do have to, you know, take your photos, upload your menu, your ingredients, your reheating instructions, because all the food is cold and you need reheating instructions. We help you with photography. We help you with storytelling and bio. We do your headshots for you. And so, you know, the main constraint that we're working on right now is not how to find people, but just how to onboard more quickly. That's like the constraint we have as a business is making sure we can onboard all these people who are applying. But most people find out about us, honestly, through word of mouth, or they see ads for the consumers and they say, oh, I can cook. A lot of our consumers actually become cooks. Like you see that happening where they order and they're like, oh, I could do this. Yeah. Yeah. I know someone or my mother knows how to cook. Well, let me tell her about it. So you see a lot of that word of mouth happening. I love that. That's, that's so amazing. So what is the most memorable meal you've had on the chef platform? You know, it's funny. If you ask this question to anyone on the team, and we actually ask it as an interview question, right? What is your, your favorite homemade meal? And um, but if you ask anyone on the team, and I think if you ask any of our users, it's actually not their The response is not about the food or the item or the meal. It's more about the story behind it. And for me, my response in the interview was always this dish called brijol. Mm. And growing up in an Italian family, we always had this dish called brijol for every Christmas, every holiday. And it really is a labor of love to create this dish. It takes all day. You take a flank steak and you roll it like a giant sushi roll. And you have prosciutto in there and hard-boiled eggs and mozzarella and parmesan. And so it's like a giant meatball filled with goodness. and you know, as a kid growing up, I was, I would always look forward to Christmas dinner because we'd get this one dish. We only could have it once a year. And it's a, it really is a labor of love. And because of that, I've never seen it at a restaurant, definitely not in the U S and I've never even seen it at a restaurant in Italy because it's just, it's such a specialty dish. That's hard to make. And when we expanded to New York and we were living in Brooklyn, we onboarded this chef. Her name was Jessica. And she was born in Tuscany. She immigrated to Brooklyn not too long ago. Wonderful woman. And you get to submit samples for vetting and taste testing before you're approved on the platform. And during that process, I found out she made brijol. And I was like, oh my, I, can't, I couldn't believe it. I called my dad. I told my dad that there was a, a chef in New York that was going to put brijol onto the platform. And so my dad insisted that he buy dinner for our whole team that was out in the Airbnb. And this was my last meal I had in Brooklyn before I flew back. And we had this big feast. We bought all this food from Jessica and it was delivered. And it was the first time outside of a family made dinner I ever had Brujol. And it's one of the few times in my entrepreneurial career that I had tears in my eyes. And there's an actual video of this that I'll never show the public, but I had tears in my eyes because of happiness, just because like this was so special. And and I'd heard this from so many people before I had it. So a lot of our a lot of our early adoption was like all these chefs cooking South Asian food, Indian food, South like Thai food, and they, they were actual immigrants and expats from those areas. And a lot of people ordering it were immigrants and expats from those areas who hadn't had authentic food from their region of Indian, like Kerala or Gujarati food in years and they would write in saying it brought tears to their eyes right and i i never understood that until i had brujol on the platform and so for me that was like my most memorable food experience uh definitely on the chef platform. i love it do you know i've now brought their company up a couple of times do you know my place 
Yeah. I come, yeah, yeah, yeah. I listened to the podcast with, with the founder, yeah. She's a, uh, and Mir, and anyway, they're married. I used, I knew them actually before. I knew them separately, and then I found out that they met each other and they got married, but they're kind of the same story. I mean, they found that like the most interesting, you know, dinner parties that they would have, she's from Pakistan and Mir's Persian and you know, they would have these really, they'd bring in all these cultures and then people would tell these stories around their grandparents and how they used to make these certain dishes. And then people would bring those in and, and oftentimes they couldn't do it because of, they didn't have the pans. They didn't have the right equipment in order to do that. And so anyway, I, I think that the stories that they've been able to, you know, resurrect for so many people has also been you know, a great, obviously great product, but also great stories, because I think it just makes people smile and remember, you know, lots of things that they think about, you know, as you just described. So that that's awesome. So, so what do you think is the key difference between, you know, this startup and, you know, Katoa, and maybe just overall, like, you know, Facebook and some of the other stuff that you've done? I mean, what, what do you think is the, like the key thing that you see? Yeah. You know, I think one that Kato and a lot of other businesses, at least that I had tried to do in the past and I've worked on, were really about a product, right? They're really focused on manufacturing or distributing a product. And it was not so much. And I think I, I learned a lot in doing that. In Chef, we, we never really talk about product. We talk about community. We talk about people. We talk about the chefs cooking on the platform. And even as you alluded, and, and that's one big learning I had in my first venture, right? Where, where I was a solo founder, I bootstrapped, I, I didn't raise any outside capital for five years. I didn't have a single employee for five years until we were in 3,000 stores. Much different journey, you know, working by myself. That came to a head finally after about five years. And I ended up living in the storage room of our warehouse for most of 2016. I don't know if you know that, but I didn't pay myself for six years. And at, at some point I did run out of money. And I think the biggest thing I learned was you need to surround yourself with an amazing team. And that's one thing we did really well this time. Amazing partners, advisors, investors, and an amazing team. I, the thing I'm most proud of in our entire business is actually our team, I would say. That's awesome. And then too, it's just like, yeah, the community and the really the reason why you're building it is not about the product, but it's about the people. And so I think I love that podcast about my place, right? So, Mm -hmm. so much because that's exactly what we talk about at Chef so much, which is, I think when we first started the company, we we talked about the value proposition of the platform. And it was really about two things, right? Is for the chefs, we wanted to provide a meaningful, meaningful access to income from home, right? To make meaningful income from home and to do that broadly in in like a democratic way way so everyone can have access to opportunity and then the second side was like on the consumer side i wanted people like myself going off to college to have access to high quality affordable meals so on our on our platform you can find like a full meal for under ten dollars whereas if you're ordering from doordash or grubhub you're going to pay 15 25 i think the average you pay for a single meal is above 20 dollars if i was ordering at least yeah yeah hundred percent. And so it's very hard to eat healthy when it costs you over $20. And it's a restaurant quality meal, which we all know like a homemade meal is, is different. And so I think the one surprise that we found and really the focus of the company now is not just like, can we deliver high quality affordable meals and can we provide meaningful income to these chefs on the platform? We know we can do that, but it's much deeper than that. Like what we found and like what really excites me right now is that food, food really transcends boundaries, right? It's like universally understood. I think it's a common playing field that we can all meet on and start having discussions and conversations. And so some of my favorite meals on the platform, when I order from like Shireen, for example, like that's amazing because I've never had Egyptian food. So that was incredible. I got to explore Egyptian food for the first time and I love it. So now I order from Shireen every week. But also like knowing who Shireen is, the fact that Shireen, like whenever she cooks for me, she cooks extra and she like donates it to a local shelter and and the East Bay and like all the things like her story coming from Egypt and why she cooks and how these like dips and sauces that she makes from her family, which are now on the platform. Like I think that these stories 
especially right now when a lot of us are so divided in the U.S., can bring us together and really create a common ground for us to all have a conversation. Because I think these are oftentimes people cooking for you that you would not normally interact with unless you were to order food from them and learn their story. And so I think we've really tried to be very intentional about that. I mean, one example is, you know, we join YC and YC, of course, is tech incubator. And the first question they ask you is like, where is your tech co-founder? And they expect that my co-founder and I are not tech. We're not tech co-founders. We have no technical background. We have no idea how to code. And so they really say, you know, your first hire should then be an engineer. Our first full-time hire was actually a head of storytelling because like we care that much about the stories on our platform. And that's why if you go to chef.com, every single profile is going to have their bio, a video, their photos, and why they chose to cook on the platform. So I think like it's easy to say we're, we're more affordable or we provide you know income for people. But I think the the real reason that people are attracted to our platform, the real difference is the stories behind the food and the connection with the food. And that's really something you can't replicate, right? You know, it's funny, ages ago, I, I was just thinking about, so my dad, you know, founded a brand inside of a large company called Healthy Choice. And it was inside of Armor Food Company initially, and then ConAgra. And it was funny, I got a phone call a couple of years ago from an advertising agency that was working on the product on sort of, it's still alive today. It's one of the top products for ConAgra. And, you know, they were looking for my dad who passed away 10 years ago. And I said, what, you know, what can I help you with? And they said, you know, we heard that your dad was actually the original packaging for Healthy Choice. He told stories of like where the product came from, what were the stories? And, you know, of course, as a kid, we found it incredibly annoying that he like cared and focused so much on this, but, you know, people really appreciated it. And, you know, eventually as time went on, they did away with these, but stories like he would tell us that, that the shrimp came from, from St. Simon's Island, that there were, you know, off the coast of Georgia and that these people actually went out at four o'clock in the morning. And so in order for you to actually have, you know, this incredible shrimp, like that's what they felt that they needed to do in order to get the best shrimp. And by the way, he has two kids, you know, he tries to have breakfast with them on Saturday and Sunday, but during the week he's committed to his role. And like he would tell these stories and no one was doing this. Like he was almost one of the original storytellers. So you know, as, as so many people have said with Hint, like not surprised that this is what you do in terms of, you know, telling a lot of these stories. But anyway, I feel like it's something that it never goes away. And I think even more so now. And, you know, people really, I think being an immigrant today is an important part of somebody's identity too. And I think that a lot of people, even if, you know, they grew up their whole life in the US, they had grandparents or you know, parents that brought over just different cultural, you know, items that they always wanted to have. So I think this is such a great idea. And like you said, even exploring, like having, you know, Egyptian food when you've just never even had a chance to do that. So, and you're just in the Bay Area and New York right now, or? Yeah, currently the Bay Area and New York, and and we're testing a few other markets now and hoping to expand more. And I I love that you're I really love that your dad did that. And I I think that you maybe don't credit yourself enough, but you've done an incredible job about, you know, putting you yourself and your story behind Hint, right? And I think that aside from, you know, maintaining our identity and the tradition and the cultural values and like having this thing that transcends any boundaries between us, I think the incredible part that's actually more practical, and you probably see this, is that when you tell stories behind the food, it actually creates a lot more accountability, transparency, right? You can't, you know, who knows like these dark cloud kitchens that are changing names every month in some warehouses is happening across the Bay, right? A lot of people consider that our competitor and that is not how we ever want to be, right? Because first of all, that person unfortunately doesn't feel the same pride in the food that they're cooking because they have no connection between them, their food and their consumer. And second of all, like you as a consumer have no idea who's cooking the food, where it's coming from, why, where. And so I think that 
besides the fact that it makes us feel good and I think will build community over time, I think there's a real practical reason to storytell, which is it creates accountability and transparency. Ultimately, I think that leads to better outcomes for the consumer. I think it leads to better diets. And I think it leads to more pride in the work for the supply side as well. Absolutely. I think that's that's so key. So are you guys delivering in Marin County or do I need to have it delivered to my office? We, we, <laughs> it's funny. People keep asking. We're coming to Marin. We are, we are in the entire Bay Area, but not quite to the entire North Bay. And you can actually now go to chef.com, which is much easier to remember. Um, so it's just shef.com. Awesome. That's great. Well, I can have it delivered to my office in San Francisco and then uh, I'll get it from there because I, I know I tried a couple of weeks ago and, and Marin wasn't open yet. And I think it said coming soon. So I was, I was like, but that's, that's awesome. Really, really great. So Joey, how do people find you, keep up with you guys and what you're doing? I mean, obviously chef.com, but Joey Gracia on most platforms, which platform are you using mostly find me anywhere just my full name joey gracia twitter instagram i use a lot or facebook.com slash joey awesome well this is so great and you guys when you're listening to this and you like it please give joey a great review and um, definitely subscribe to unstoppable and thank you so much joey really really excited that you came on thank you so much for having me thanks yeah awesome If you like what you heard, please help spread the word and leave us a review. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to Spotlight? Please talk to me at Kara Golden on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, be unstoppable. Unstoppable. unstoppable.